Good morning. Welcome to the webinar, Using State Prescription Drug Monitoring Programs to Reduce Drug Overdoses. My name is Holly Hendrickson, and I will be moderating the webinar today. I am a Senior Policy Specialist with the Health Program at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I cover the issue of prescription drug overdoses and abuse. We're glad to have you here today to learn about prescription drug monitoring programs. Our intent is to explore a few ways states have made their PDMPs more effective. We will have a question and answer period for our two after our two pre pre presentations. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box, and I will ask our speakers to address them following their presentations. Our presenters today are John Eady and Terrence O'Leary. John Eady is the director of the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program Center of Excellence at Brandeis University. For 44 years, he has served in management, executive, and consulting capacities in the field of public health. As director of the Division of Public Health Protection in the New York State Department of Health from 1985 to 1995, he directed the state's pharmaceutical diversion program, including the PDMP. He co-founded both the Alliance of States with prescription, prescription Monitoring Programs and the National Association of State Controlled Substances Authority, served as president for both organizations, and held other posts. Since leaving state service in 2001, he has served as a consultant on PDMPs, including serving as the administrative reviewer for the Massachusetts PMP. PMP. Our second speaker, Terrence O'Leary, currently serves as the director of the New York State Department of Health Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement. As the director of B&E, Terrence is responsible for managing New York's updated prescription monitoring program registry. Terrence also oversees New York State's official prescription program, which has provided over 1.47 billion forge-proof serialized prescription forms to practitioners since 2005. Each year, B&E issues over 1,500 licenses to manufacturers, distributors, institutional pharmacies, researchers, and other entities seeking to engage in controlled substance-related activity. Terrence supervises investigators located in six regional offices who annually conduct approximately 1,000 investigations into the violations of New York State's Controlled Substance Act. So John, our first speaker, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I, having been involved in working on prescription drug monitoring program issues since 1985, I can say that the, the discussion topic for today is one of the more, uh, in fact, one of the most exciting things that's happened. Until now, uh, PDMPs, prescription drug monitoring programs, have succeeded in slowing down the expansion of the epidemic of opioids and other drugs, and in some cases bringing, uh, 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 bringing that partially under control. But it is the development of the mandatory use uh, where states are man mandating that prescribers use the system before the first prescription of a controlled substance, uh, and certainly an opioid, and then periodically thereafter, that we have seen the first opportunity where there has been actually uh, a, a cutback in the total uh, scope of the problem. Uh, we've seen dramatic de decreases in doctor shopping. We've seen dramatic uh, changes coming. And so I welcome the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, next slide, please. The, why are our states mandating prescribers to enroll? Uh, as pointed out here, it can take years for prescribers to register to use PDMPs voluntarily. Even states that have been at it for up to 10 years have found that they have still less than half of the physicians, or only half the physicians, registered to use the data. And when, even after registration, the prescriber's use of the data is limited when it's left as a voluntary activity. Next. The states with mandates, on the other hand, are finding that prescriber registration accelerates immediately after the mandate goes into effect. The prescriber use of the data accelerates even more. Uh, doctor shopping decreases and total opioid prescribing decreases, except for opioids used to treat drug abuse, uh, primarily Suboxone. Next. Why is prescriber use of PDMD data so important? First, it's necessary 
for prescribers to, uh, to provide quality medical care to know what drugs, what quantities, and what strengths of drugs their patients have previously obtained. All of this information is available with, as regards controlled substances within the PDMP database. Prescribers can obtain this information. Um, excuse me, just one moment here. I'm having a technical difficulty that I've now overcome. Um, prescribers can obtain this data by checking the, with the PDMP before the first prescription and periodically thereafter. Oh, as an example of this, there is an Ohio Emergency Department study that shows prescriber, uh, prescribers examined patients in pain and developed a plan of treatment for pain before they actually examined the PDMP data. Then they went and checked the PDMP data. After checking, the prescribers changed the plan for some 41% of all the patients, almost half. And of those where there was a change, 61% prescribed fewer or no opioids compared to what they had planned to do prior to looking at the PDMP data. But 39% actually felt free afterwards to prescribe more opioids because their examination of the PDMP data identified that their person was not in abuse, and therefore they felt comfortable in prescribing even more. Another aspect of, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Why the prescriber use of PDMP data is important is another issue, and that's the majority of prescribers are unaware of patients who may be doctor shopping. When they don't have a clue that the patient may be doctor shopping, they have no idea when to ask for the PDMP data to detect doctor shopping. Next, please. The, uh, the next point that's really important is that the, um, oh, excuse me. Yeah. Massachusetts has done a survey of prescribers who were sent what we refer to as unsolicited reports. I, I pardon the background noise. I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old grandson who just walked in the door. Um, Massachusetts survived the prescribers who were sent unsolicited reports by the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. The PDMP analyzed the data and sent our reports to patients, of, or to reports of patients to the doctors with where the patients were going with multiple provider episodes, i.e. they were possible doctor shoppers. Of the responders to the survey, the prescribers indicated that only 8.4% of them were aware of most all or nearly all of the other prescribers. And with PDMP data in hand now, they were able to determine that at least about 70% of them were able that, to determine that there was, as far as they could see, no basis for the prescriptions that were issued. So the key point, again, is that the prescribers were unaware prior to looking at the PDMP data, and in fact, in this case, being proactively sent the data by the PDMP, they had no idea that their patients were, in fact, involved in doctor shopping. And this is a significant reason why it is so essential because uh, if it's left as a voluntary act, prescribers aren't going to spend the time looking when they don't suspect something is wrong. But as shown clearly by the Massachusetts study, that the uh, that they have very little opportunity to have a clue without looking at the data that there is a problem. So, in response to that, three states, Kentucky, Tennessee, and New York, have implemented mandated use uh, by prescribers of the PDMP data before prescribing. And I'm using slides hereafter that are provided by them uh, by two of the states because you'll hear directly from Terry about New York. Uh, from Kentucky, the report on their mandates indicates that the political climate in their state before the legislation was passed uh, consisted of a series of things which are common to many states. The opioid abuse is a national epidemic and an epidemic in most, in fact, in almost all states now. Controlled substance misuse and abuse was on the rise in that state. Opioid overdose deaths on the rise throughout that state, and the legislatures of that state viewed the medical community as not addressing the problem. Next slide, please. This is the Kentucky 
PDMP, uh, by the way, represents CASPER. That is the title of it, and you'll see CASPER in other places, and so that's the definition. The terms of the mandate in Kentucky are that that the, the, the prescribers must go to CASPER for 12 months of data um, and ask for it prior to the initial prescription or dispensing of a Schedule II controlled substance or a Schedule III controlled substance. They must do so after that at least every three months if prescribing is continued. And they must also review data before issuing a new prescription uh, or, uh, or for refills. Additional rules uh, included in licensure board regulations. Uh, next slide, please. There are exceptions after surgery, patients in long-term, in hospitals and long-term care facilities, hospice care, single doses of anxiety medicine prior to a procedure, and as a substitute within seven days of initial prescribing. Uh, those are, change, those are um, exceptions they built into their law uh, after some experience with it, after a year of experience with the mandate. Next slide. The, this is a table that shows you the number of, of doctors, uh, RNs, uh, who are the pra nurse practitioners, pharmacists, who also can prescribe, and it shows you the numbers before and after the new mandate went into effect. That is the numbers who had master accounts with the PDMP. And you can see that there was a rapid uh, change in July of 2012, which is when the new regulation and the new laws went into effect. And that continued uh, to even rise after that until February of 2004. They were three times the level they had been before. Next slide. Uh, this slide reflects the number of CASPER reports, that is the number of reports provided um, in thousands uh, to the practitioners in the state um, to do their work. And you can see the steady rise from 2006 to 2013 with this rapid takeoff in 2012 when the new rule was, and law was implemented in uh, the middle of the year 2012. And by 2013, you can see that it was almost six times higher than it had been in 2011, the year before the uh, rule went into effect. Next slide. This is a report on the Tennessee mandate. And this contains uh, recommendations from and comments from the state health commissioner who presented this series of slides, uh, both he and the uh, staff from, the, from Kentucky presented, along with Terry O'Leary, at the National Prescription Drug Abuse Summit, which was held in April of this year. And these are slides that I have um, borrowed from their presentations to give you firsthand experience from them. And in this case, the, uh, the comment is appropriate as the, as the prescription drug monitoring program inquiries go up, doctor shopping goes down lives get saved, and there are fewer addictions. The next slide, please. This slide gives you graphically the change. So you can see the change in the numbers of requests for reports and numbers of searches. That's in the green. Uh, you can see what happened dramatically in 2013 when their new regulation and law went into effect. And you can see in the blue the number of people considered doctor shoppers uh, and the rapid decrease that occurred in the state of Tennessee after the new um, mandate went into effect. Next slide, please. The state of Tennessee, after implementing the mandate, did a survey among practitioners and physicians and other uh, prescribers and ask them, in your opinion, is the, is the monitoring program useful for decreasing the incidence of doctor shopping? And you can see that an overwhelming majority, 80%, said yes, that they believe it is. And only a very small percentage, 6.2%, said no. Uh, there were others, there were a small number who recorded is not sure. Again, the next slide, please. This, again, is a comment by the health commissioner that prescribers do not check the PDMP in large numbers until it's mandated. The, uh, the lesson learned is that to engage prescribers to make them partners in mandating prescription drug monitoring program checking. 
Uh, that happens, as I've heard from all three states, the partnership doesn't really get started until after the mandate has gone into effect, that prior to the mandate there is resistance primarily from organized medicine. But after the mandate is in effect and the prescribers have experience with it and see the benefits of it, that changes into a pro and positive uh, uh, response where the resistance is ended. Uh, next slide, please. The, the mandate for monitoring and the checking of the monitoring program obviously resulted in more inquiries. And you can see the before and after figures in terms of the numbers of requests being made of the system by pres the prescribers. And you can see also there's an orange block on top, and that is that Tennessee, along with the mandate, also um, made it feasible for prescribers uh, to use delegates to look up the data for them. As a practical matter, I think every state that has every state that has mandated has gone to uh, the process of allowing delegates to do the search, and that um, and it is the responsibility of the prescriber thereafter to oversee and manage and supervise what their delegates do when accessing the data and maintaining the the patient confidentiality that's required. Um, but the delegate use of the data is a, an effective step to ameliorate the impact of the new um, mandate. Next slide, please. Pres the comment is, again, that prescribers using the PDMP are now more likely to discuss substance abuse with patients and refer to treatment. This is a very essential stage uh, and a step that prescribers need to take if we're going to stop this epidemic, and that is to get them to talk to their patients about what's going on and to get them to work proactively with their patients. Uh, and the experience across the board that we've seen is, is like Tennessee's, and that is that when they use the PDMP data, it provides the prescribers with a basis for interjecting and for talking to their patients about the data, and that leads to treatment in many cases where it wasn't possible before. And you can see that, um, that there, the lesson learned is that this may have a long-term beneficial impact and certainly appears to be that way. Uh, next slide. The next slide again is that in Tennessee, the prescription drug monitoring program is very important in, in achieving a plateau in morphine milligram equivalent. Uh, this is medical language, let me explain, that morphine milligram equivalents, all opioids have a, an equivalence uh, at some level to morphine milligrams. Uh, and that allows for comparison, regardless of the drug, to see how much uh, opioid a pay particular patient is receiving. Uh, the reason this is important is that research in recent years has identified that at the time that a patient reaches uh, 100 milligrams per day of opioids, of morphine equivalents of opioids, that they have about a nine percent, nine, sorry, a nine times greater risk of death than if they are not receiving opioids, and that it, it, it escalates and increases across the line um, and, of course, gets even higher if you go beyond 100 milligrams per day. And what we have been seeing across the country is that along with the increased prescribing and along with the increase in numbers of patients receiving uh, opioids, that there has also been a significant increase in the average dose patients are receiving. And it has become an increasingly significant part of the overdoses and deaths that so many patients are receiving such high dosages, sometimes by intent on the part of the practitioners, many times not by intent of the practitioners, but rather by the, the artful doctor shopping techniques of the uh, patients. Um, and so uh, what they comment, the comment here is that the lesson learned is that by decreasing the morphine milligram equivalents, there's been an associated drop in overdose deaths in other states, and that Tennessee is expecting that the, what they've seen in their results already, which is a reduction in, or certainly a plateauing, if not a reduction yet, in morphine milligram equivalents per patient per day, and that they anticipate that this will help um, reduce deaths. Next slide, please. That the next point is that all partners must work together to constrain the market on opiate addiction. And success is found by focusing trilaterally on treatment, control, and prevention. 
and the PDMP data is an absolutely essential part of that process. And what the states are telling us is that they have found that by mandating the use of the PDMP data, that they can achieve this result in a much greater way than was ever possible previously. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide is informational. It shows you our website address, and I encourage you to go there. We have uh, constantly provided updates of information for people to review and to understand what's going on. And we have a briefing there on the mandate uh, for prescription use um, as a mandatory issue in the three states, and in fact can make that available to you um, certainly on our website, but we also, if, if it would be helpful, can provide it to you, all of you who are listening through the National Council on State Legislators. In fact, I would uh, recommend that you take a look at that and that, um, and that we also will keep that up to date in the future and add to it uh, as new information becomes available. Uh, next slide and last slide, please. Uh, that has my contact information, and I encourage any of you in, who is listening to has a question or interest to please be in contact with me or with our Center of Excellence. We are more than happy to be of assistance to you. We consider this uh, mandatory uh, use of PDMP data to be one of the most important changes that has occurred uh, in, the, in decades in the PDMP, um, perhaps the most important thing since all states implemented PDMPs. Uh, all states, that is, except Missouri. And we are very encouraged by the changes that are occurring, and we think this mandate process is very important to be for states to consider. Uh, I will now turn it over uh, to uh, back to the National Center for uh, State Legislators and to Terry O'Leary, who is the next presenter. Uh, thank you, John, very much. Um, so I'm going to present on New York State's experience with implementing uh, mandated use of a prescription monitoring program, uh, as well as a couple of other things we did at the same time. So back in 2012, um, uh, back in 2012, sorry, New York uh, passed a bill that's largely referred to as ISTOP. It was a joint governor uh, Cuomo as well as our attorney general program bill, and it was voted unanimously. Uh, every senator and every assembly member voted in favor of this law, despite overwhelming opposition by different medical societies, professional societies, and the rest. Um, and there were a couple of galvanizing events within New York. One was the murder of four people in a pharmacy on Long Island on Father's Day in June 2012. And uh, another was there was a shooting afterwards of an ATF agent off duty who was breaking up a pharmacy robbery. And th those two tragic events, as well as the worsening uh, opioid epidemic in New York State, uh, led to the passage of this law. So the first part is I stop, which stands for Internet system to track over prescribing. It actually just updates our PMP and uh, mandates that it be used. The second part is a move to mandatory electronic prescribing for all prescription drugs, both controlled and non-controlled. And New York will make that shift on March 27th of next year, 2015. Uh, we did make a couple of changes to our controlled substance schedules. We moved hydrocodone to Schedule 2, something that I believe the federal government's looking to uh, do now. And we also scheduled tramadol and placed it on Schedule 4. Uh, and you'll see later there was some interesting data that um, scheduling tramadol revealed. We created a work group of all the stakeholders uh, to make sure that the implementation of this law uh, was appropriate. And finally, a safe disposal program where we create a network of drop-off sites for medications statewide. Um, so ISTOP actually took effect a year after it was signed into law. As I mentioned, it overhauled New York's prescription monitoring program. As you heard, uh, John Eady was actually uh, an administrator overseeing the PMP back in 85, uh, starting in 1985. New York has collected this data since 1972. New York actually litigated the right of states to collect this data to the U.S. Supreme Court in a case entitled Whalen v. Roe back in 1977, and uh, we've been collecting it in one form or another since. Uh, the ISTOP requires that practitioners consult the PMP before prescribing for the purpose of informing their clinical decision. And it also required that those who are dispensing, usually pharmacists, but sometimes uh, 
there are other types of dispensers, including practitioners, that they report data into the PMP within 24 hours. Previously, based upon a law that had been developed, a regulation that had been developed when paper was being submitted, uh, it was required only monthly. So the duty to consult requires that every practitioner uh, must consider their patient's information prior to prescribing any controlled substance listed in Schedule 2, 3, or 4, which are the three, uh, the three schedules which have the drugs that are considered most prone to diversion and abuse that are allowed to be prescribed. Uh, in New York State, this composes about 22 of the 23.5 million prescriptions for controlled substances dispensed in any given year. Uh, they must also consider the data no more than 24 hours before prescribing. We don't make the prescribers do it at the time they actually issue the prescription. John mentioned earlier that to accommodate workflow, states have allowed designees or delegates to access the information on the practitioner's behalf, and we do that here in New York. We also say they can access the data up to 24 hours before they prescribe. So usually they'll have staff members either access the night before or the morning of and print out the entire patient roster uh, so that they have it handy during the visit so they don't have to go and consult the system in the middle of their uh, 15 to 16 minute scheduled visits. So in terms of data collection, uh, as I mentioned, dispensers had to report to us within 24 hours as opposed to monthly. This was actually the, the most difficult part for the department to implement, and it was the heaviest ask of any of our stakeholders to get pharmacies. Uh, and We required veterinarians to report within 24 hours. In Kentucky, they did not require veterinarians to report within 24 hours. They, they require it weekly, I believe. Um, if your state is going to close the time frame in which you're going to have dispensers report, uh, you should definitely consider the issue of veterinarians and in what time frame do you need them to report and then reason, have your reasons ready as to why it's within that time frame, why you're going to require them like every other pharmacy or why you're going to differentiate them. Uh, New York State, uh, our information technology services organization built a new data collection tool that makes reporting in much easier and allows for unattended reporting. So the file is collected daily uh, and it is uh, pushed through secure FTP. And to increase the accuracy of the data, we also required that a number of critical error fields be expanded so that um, if internal systems are being used for things other than collecting the data, that they'll be rejected. And one of my favorite examples that we used to see was you would have the name of a patient and pharmacists would try to warn other pharmacists about a particular patient. And they would write things in like first name Terrence, last name O'Leary, and then in parentheses, do not take check from or check ID. Um, which is great, but most of these PMPs uh, do not have unique identifiers. In New York State, we're not allowed to collect a unique identifier. So we rely upon the accuracy of the data being entered in. And Terrence O'Leary is a different person than Terrence O'Leary do not take check from unless you have a very advanced algorithm uh, to screen that out. So uh, in terms of implementing the law, uh, it, as I mentioned, this was opposed by most professional societies. Uh, and they very closely watched the implementation of the law after it was passed. Uh, and so what we did in the Department of Health was extensive outreach. I myself did over 100 presentations and webinars over the year after it was passed and before it went into effect. You can see a list of some of the different people that we met with. Um, and what I found and what other staff members found was that you had to tailor your presentation to your audience, which sounds obvious. But for one example, when you're speaking to doctors and you're speaking to medical professionals, I found that they don't want to hear about doctor shopping and they don't want to hear about crime and they don't want to hear about the criminal justice side of it. What they want to hear are uh, some of the studies that John showed you, uh, specifically the one that showed when you incorporate PMP uh, data into prescribing decisions, it will change the prescribing decision two out of five times. The doctor actually says, wait, I was wrong. I made the wrong choice here. I need to correct. Uh, and everyone assumes it will calm or bring down the amount of uh, opioids being prescribed. But as you saw in 39%, I think about 16 or 17% of the overall events, 
it actually increased the total number, the total morphine equivalent doses, or it resulted in a rotation to a separate opioid. The data told these doctors, I am under treating this patient's pain or mistreating this patient's pain, which is a very, very valuable stat to have when you speak to advocates for patients, uh, people from palliative care settings who have concerns that all this is going to do is turn away uh, legitimate patients and block them from getting legitimate care. So during all this outreach, uh, one of the things that the Department of Health wanted to do was respond to all concerns. Um, we took questions at every single presentation. Uh, some of them were very informed and uh, really helped move us along. Some were rants. Uh, I had one individual actually try to put his hands on me, but you know, part of this whole process was engaging those who we were asking them to do something. One concrete example of where the communication early on helped was New York has a number of teaching institutions. We have 91 teaching hospitals in the state, and unlicensed residents and interns do not have a license with uh, New York State. They do not have DEA registrations, and therefore giving them access to patient identifying data proved very difficult. What we were able to do working with our associations was to build a tool where the institutions themselves could decide who was going to access, and they would stand in the stead of a practitioner so that the burden of creating designee accounts was not put on uh, attendings uh, overseeing residents and interns. It worked very well, and it was a, a success story coming out of all the outreach that we did. One thing that I'll make very clear is the worst of the outreach was all predating the mandate. Since the law went into effect, um, the presentations, the tone of the audience has changed. Uh, we don't get yelled at anymore. What we hear is, this has changed my practice. And there's always someone who shares the story about, well, there was that one patient I would have hung my hat on wasn't getting over on me. And sure enough, it did. Uh, we talk about prescriber education and guidelines in other states, and there's been movement. But the use of the PMP is an educational tool, not only on the very granular level of giving you information about the person across the desk from the practitioner, but it also gives them an, an awareness that this problem is within their own practice. It's not just down the street. It's not just in the emergency departments. Uh, and I will say that, by and large, the medical community has been extremely happy with the way this was rolled out. Um, the, a lot of their fears were allayed, and uh, it's led to some positive results here in New York. So I'm going to show you, John mentioned uh, the use of PMPs. You can see here, New York first made the PMP data available online to practitioners in January 2010. We rolled out our new system in June 2013, uh, two months ahead of schedule. And when we rolled out the new system, we found there was a slight increase uh, in the total number of users. However, once the duty to consult went into effect in August, you can see that we went from less than 5,000 users in three and a half years to over 40,000 users in any given month. Uh, along with the increase in users, you see an increase in the number of patients that uh, were being searched for. Right here, you can see the number of unique patients. We had uh, over 1, 000, or 1 million searches of patients in any given month and almost 1.5 million searches uh, in total. So some patients were looked for uh, more than once. In terms of who was performing the searches, almost 70% were done by those with a medical license from New York State. The next highest group were nurse practitioners, and pharmacists who never had access to this data now comprise almost 10% of all searches being performed within New York State. Um, in terms of whether it's the practitioner themselves or a designee performing the search, about across all of the professions, with the exception of pharmacists, about two-thirds of the search are actually done by the practitioner themselves, and the other third are done by a designee. So what was the result of this? The immediate result was we saw a decrease in doctor shopping. Um, 
we in New York State never had less than 300 individuals in a given month who were going to five or more pharmacies, uh, cashing prescriptions from five or more doctors. And that is until iStop went into effect. As you can see right here, in the first month, uh, full month, September of 2013, it went down to just over 100 individuals. Since then, we've seen a decrease um, including only 40 individuals in the month of February. Um, this has given my investigators a, a, a place to start. We can actually review each and every case and make more measured decisions um, because the number of individuals that we find meeting this threshold has dropped off precipitously. In terms of the effect on prescribing, this slide shows you prescriptions for opioids as well as uh, we included pregabalin, which is not an opioid, uh, Lyrica, but it's a Schedule 5 prescription drug, and we incl I included it for a couple of reasons. So this slide will show you the decrease we saw in hydrocodone when we placed it on Schedule 2. You can see it dropped off precipitously and it continued to go down over time. It was replaced by oxycodone products as the number one prescribed controlled substance in all of New York State. There wasn't a marked increase in oxycodone, but the increase we did see was among combination products such as Percocet. Uh, so we believe what happened was prescribing went down overall, and it went down by about 9% for all opioids. However, any increase we saw was an increase in uh, combination oxycodone products, which told us hydrocodone probably should have been a Schedule II before since it was interchangeable with a Schedule II drug. Once we scheduled tramadol uh, and were able to track it, we found out that it was the third highest prescribed painkiller in New York State. Uh, we had read some journal articles and had some data that showed that tramadol was often abused, uh, that it interacts with the opioid receptor and can feed an opioid addiction. And since it wasn't a controlled substance, free samples were available and they weren't safeguarded nearly as uh, closely as it should have been. Uh, we have since seen a decrease in tramadol prescribing since it was scheduled, and I believe the DEA is moving tramadol in, onto the federal schedules, uh, I think, next month. In terms of benzodiazepine prescribing, it has remained relatively flat in New York uh, since the implementation of uh, iStop. Uh, the one drug that continues, class of drugs that continues to go up are stimulants. Um, so the top line, the purple line amphetamine, that is primarily Adderall. The green line is methylphenidate is Ritalin. Um, and you can see that it goes up month over month. Uh, and the use of the PMP has not slowed the prescribing of stimulants. You'll notice that there's definitely a pattern to when it spikes and when it drops off. Uh, it drops off every June when school ends. It spikes, it goes up again in September, but spikes in October. And I've been told by a couple of practitioners that that's a direct result of parent-teacher conferences. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested, the New York Times did an excellent uh, article on the selling of ADHD, uh, and it included a citation that every single manufacturer of a major ADHD drug has been cited by the FDA for either misbranding, mislabeling, or otherwise mischaracterizing their drug. So just to go very quickly to a couple of other things that New York State has done, the move to mandatory electronic prescribing, I believe we are the first in the country to do this. It's going to be for controlled and non-controlled. We believe it will uh, thwart a number of diversion, uh, people seeking to divert or forge prescriptions. Uh, we're requiring for controls that everyone comply with the DEA's rule, which was issued in March of 2010. Uh, other things that we recently did, New York has been a leader in the use of naloxone, and thankfully it's spreading throughout the country. Since 2006, New York has trained over 15,000 people in the use of naloxone. In the last year, we've trained over 1,200 uh, police officers, excuse me, in the last three months, we've trained over 1,200 police officers in the use of naloxone as well, which has resulted in over 1,500 lives saved and overdoses reversed. Uh, we expanded coverage for addiction treatment services, uh, to, including coverage of inpatient during an appeal of a claims denial. And finally, we created increased penalties for practitioners or pharmacists who illegally dispense controlled substances. Uh, this is my contact information. Um, I'd like to thank NCSL for the opportunity to present. And uh, at this point, I, I will turn it back over to Tricia, or to Holly, sorry. 
Thank you so much. So we will now move on into the question and answer period. And just for a reminder, please enter your questions in the Q&A box and I will ask speakers to address them. So our first question is about data privacy or concerns about data privacy. What safety measures have been set up for the patient in terms of personal information protection? So in New York State, um, the, the privacy of the data is protected by our public health law. And uh, we only give direct access to practitioners and to those within the Department of Health. We keep an audit trail of everybody who queries. Uh, we actually um, have uh, had a couple of instances where we found that um, there was an unauthorized access. Uh, which has resulted in a criminal action. We search to see if certain per, uh, popular names or celebrities or politicians or other public figures are being searched for uh, to make sure that it's appropriate. Um, I mentioned that we give access to designees. Um, the way on, in our system that we do that, the practitioner themselves are responsible for every search, whether they do it or their designee does it. It's a strict liability statute. They can click on someone uh, and designate them within a drop-down uh, menu after they've created an account with the Department of Health. We give the practitioner access to audit tools so they can look up every search that they've done and they can look up every search that their uh, designees have done under their account. So while we can tell if someone has looked up a particular celebrity um, and that may not be uh, an authorized search, we won't know if someone is a patient. We allow people to look up whether or not they're prescribing. And so we don't know if that person is a patient, but by using this audit tool and making it available to practitioners, um, we have had cases where they've told us, my designee has done an unauthorized search. Uh, that has led to people um, in a couple of instances being arrested. It's also led to people being excluded from being able to handle this data. So creating a strong audit trail and the ability to utilize that audit trail and enforcement was something that New York uh, dedicated itself to early on. And, and this is, John, I can add to that that, that nationally uh, there has been a consistency of states requiring uh, that uh, in, in their statutes and in their regulations governing what the prescription drug monitoring programs go, there are very specific limitations on who has access, just like in New York State, and there are significant penalties for breaching of that. And it has simply been a, non, a very small, uh, very infrequent uh, factor that were, and Terry has mentioned one or two examples in the state of New York, which has been at this since the 1970s. And that is true across the country. There are very, there have been a few, but the penalties have worked, the process has worked effectively, and the um, perpetrators who have been effectively dealt with regardless of their background. And, and especially among state employees or other employees who have access to the data, the penalties are very severe, not uh, including, of course, uh, loss of job, but uh, can be much more significant than that. Great, thank you. Uh, so John or Terrence, how, how did legislators in the states that pass mandatory usage, how did legislators address the opposition from prescribers? Do you have any lessons learned or any examples of how, how this was maneuvered in the legislature? I, I think Terry can give the best examples uh, of the answers. And from what I know from talking with people in Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, his answers will speak for them as well. So, as I mentioned, there were a couple of galvanizing events in New York um, which brought this to the forefront, and the Attorney General uh, proposed this bill partnering with a senator and an assemblyman from, I, I believe both were from Staten Island, who, um, which is a portion of New York City, which um, was, is particularly hard hit by this epidemic. Uh, there was open opposition, and this bill had been around for a little bit before the Attorney General got on board and it didn't progress. However, with that event and with the Department of Health and the Governor's Office and bringing all, not only the legislature but also the executive branch on board as well, um, it, it really brought together support. One thing as a former, pro I was a prosecutor for a decade in New York City, before that happened, um, one thing that I found very important was to to speak to the medical societies 
as medical professionals and not just to talk about criminal justice concerns. Uh, they were still opposed, but they were much, much more open to the discussions when they realized that this wasn't a system for arresting doctors. This was a system for improving New York State's health, both at a patient and population level. And so tempering the discussion as to um, what the goals of the system really was uh, helped to, I wouldn't say it got buy-in until after it was passed, but it certainly made the discussion a little more rational. Uh, and speaking with one voice, we partnered with our state legislators pretty early on in our session in 2012, which led to success. And, and this is John, the only thing, thanks Terry, I, the only thing I would add to that is that uh, the the states have all been rational and reasonable in working with the professions to create exceptions and I showed you those exceptions in my slides that are specific to the state of Kentucky but there are very similar kinds of exceptions in New York and in uh, Tennessee that were developed in response to legitimate concerns that healthcare professionals raised uh, and that helped ameliorate the situation also. Great. Thank you. So, John, I think this question is more geared towards you. Is there any way to compare provider PDMP usage among states? Uh, yes, I, I, I think we're, we're going to have to develop that. But in the meantime, I've been working on that question. And what I can tell you is that based on data reported by some 16 states around the country um, through 2013, uh, first half of 2013, that an, on, on an annualized basis, it looks like uh, the average number per prescriber, that is, the, if you take the number of prescribers in a state who are authorized by the Drug Enforcement Administration to um, provide or issue controlled substance prescriptions, and that, that is a publicly available number, and actually it's on our sister agency's website, the Training and Technical Assistance Center at Brandeis, um, which you can access by PDM, pdmpassist.org. There are there's under resources on, under the tab resources there are state profiles and if you go to the state profiles every state is listed and each state has listed the number of um, of prescribers or of, of practitioners who can uh, prescribe and that as use that as a denominator and divide that into the numbers of reports issued to prescribers per year it, the states have a wide range anywhere uh, from um, from about two to about 49. That is before the mandates went into effect. But in the two states we, for which we now have a full, uh, enough information to, uh, to go for a full year, in Kentucky we're now as high as 263 solicitor reports per prescriber. And in the state of New York it's 141 per prescriber. Now um, that's a fairly wide range, but it's due in fact to the the reality that in Kentucky they've had one of the highest rates of distribution of, of controlled substances in the country, particularly of opioids. The per capita consumption has been some of the highest in the nation. New York, on the other hand, has worked very hard at keeping this thing under control, and they are still among the lowest uh, volume per, per capita in consumption of opioids. So it's quite reasonable for them to have this dis distinction. But if you compare them, uh, once again, uh, if you use those figures, every state, if it was mandated, would probably end up someplace between 140 uh, re-solicited reports per prescriber per year and the 263 we're seeing for the uh, state of Kentucky. And, but in the meantime, we know from the data that states have, and I think if you each as a state legislators were to go back to your own agent, your own state's data, you would find that you're in the much lower range, anywhere in the maybe in the tens, maybe in the twenties per prescriber, a long way from the, uh, uh, the, per, the results that both New York and Kentucky have achieved on the use of the data. Great, thanks. So John, you mentioned Ohio's emergency department study, but either John or Terrence, do you have any, any examples or discussions of how emergency departments are complying with these reforms? Uh, Terry, can you respond to that? Sure. So uh, actually one of the exceptions within New York statute 
uh, was to exclude anything written within an emergency uh, emergency department of five days or less, a five-day supply or less. Um, what we found was the emergency departments, even though they have that exception, many of them have tried to incorporate this into their workflow so that the reports are available when the patient first uh, comes to the emergency department so that they can screen the patient um, to see if the patient is engaged in drug-seeking behavior or not. Uh, and similar to what John uh, presented in Ohio, there was recently within the last year a study put out based upon a survey in two separate Boston emergency departments. And interestingly enough, what it showed was in both emergency departments, they asked the doctors what number of patients engaged uh, di presenting with indications of pain, do you believe were engaged in drug-seeking behavior? And the numbers were very similar. I don't have them exactly. And go to Brandeis. Brandeis has got the study there. But it was between 35 and 37 percent of the patients they thought were engaged in drug-seeking behavior. Then they were given the PMP information, and it actually brought that number down to about 21 or 22 percent. That's 15 percent of all patients would have been treated as a drug seeker as opposed to a legitimate patient coming in. Um, so it has improved. Uh, it's obviously thwarted doctor shopping and given them an objective piece of uh, information where they can confront the patient and say, look, the state has told me that this is your history and I don't think a prescription is appropriate. If it's a person who's engaged in abuse, in the past but is legitimately suffering from pain like a broken arm they may ch uh, still prescribe but change the decision of what to prescribe they may prescribe a shorter supply they may choose a different type of opioid um, and, and then again it also legitimizes certain patients who are in pain so we've heard anecdotal stories here in New York we are beginning a survey but we want to wait a year to allow the use of the PMP to become operationalized uh, in all different types of practice settings before we start but we've already uh, begun the background work Great, thank you. And I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you so much, John and Terrence. And thanks again to all of you out there for joining us today. This webinar has been recorded and will be made available on NCSL's website next week. So thanks again to all of you. And this webinar is now concluded. <laughs>